I want to begin uh, this sharing by reading from the Seven Church Ages book. And I am picking this from page, um, starting from page 170. Here, Brother Branham says, just uh, the last line on page 170, he says, One night, as I was seeking the Lord, the Holy Spirit told me to pick up my pen and write. So what, we're, what I'm about to read is not just his idea, or what you can say he's... Uh, you know, words, you know. But he says, the Holy Spirit told him to pick up a pen and begin to write. I'm not reading the whole thing, but just selected portions for which we are interested in for the purpose of this uh, message today. So he says, in these last days, the true bright church, Christ's seed, will come to the headstone and she will be the super church, a super race, as she nears him. They in the bride will be so much like him that they will even be in his very image. He continues to say, this is in order to be united with him, they will be one. They will be the very manifestation of the word of the living God. Now, let me go over to page 172. Notice the harmony of the Father and the Son. Jesus never did anything until it was first showed him by the Father. This harmony is now to exist between the groom and his bride. He shows her his word of life. She receives it. She never doubts it. She performs the command of the word in his name, for she has thus said the Lord. Now here is something important for the thought we are looking at. Those in the bride do only his will. Now that is profoundly important those in the bride do only his will no one can make them do otherwise they have thus saith the Lord or they keep still now I want to share a few thoughts with you that I would title a marred vessel. You know, in, in some of our homes we have uh, objects or vessels that are made of clay. And as you have that thing in the house, with time, it may develop some cracks. Maybe because it fell down or, well, an accident happened. And so it develops a crack or it gets marred. And when something is marred, it is in a state for which it was not when it was originally made. All right, so Jeremiah 18 verse 3 
and I would want us to read this together. We, we shall read Jeremiah 18, verse 3 to 4, and that is where we are getting the, um, the thought of our sharing. Then I went down to the porter's house, and behold, he wrote a work on the wheels. Everyone say, he wrote a work on the wheels. He wrote a work on the wheels. So this is Jeremiah. You know, he goes to this place where they make uh, these clay artifacts. And he sees the potter doing something there. He says, he wrote a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So there's something he had made out of this clay. But some damage was done to it. So that it, it did not look the way it used to originally. So, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O oh, house of Israel, can I not, can I, can I, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O oh, house of Israel. Now I want to believe you and I know that God is our potter. And like this potter whom Jeremiah saw, he wrote a work on the wheels. Now you and I, we are a piece of work in God's hands. You can find that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Let us read that. We are first going to read it in King James Version. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, can you read Amplified? And I want you to pay attention to what it says in Amplified. For we are God's own handwork. Now, for we are God's own handiwork. Now, handiwork is something that you are working on. It's a piece of work like clay that is in your hands and you are working on that thing. It is an object of work. Yes, sir. Can you continue reading? His workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus. Recreated in Christ Jesus. Now, what we read in Jeremiah the potter had a, a handwork in his hands. He had created something, but then it got marred. And so he started making a new work out of that thing. Now, this strikes a chord with what we read in... Um, Ephesians 2 verse 10, isn't it? It says, we are 
recreated. Is that right? Amen. Amen. So can you read the whole passage again? For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in, in Christ Jesus, born anew. That Born anew. Or in other words, born again. Yes. That we may do those good works which God predestinated. That we may do those works. Are they works which God has just thought about right now? Is it something that God says, okay, he's born again now, so let me see what gift I can give him, or what kind of future is he going to have? Is that what it says? No. Can you read that again? For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those works which God predestinated planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, hmm. that we should walk in them, living the good life which he pre-arranged pre and made ready for us to live. God bless you. Thank you. Now that is powerful. You became born again, but that did not take God by surprise to start thinking about what would be your future. Or what will I do with him? God does not call you and then he begins to wonder what he will do with you. Whomever he calls, he already had a plan for you. And that is what, you know, the explanation in Amplified brings out. That those whom he recreated in Christ, he already prepared a path through which they should walk. But you know, in a believer's life, there's always a constant temptation to make people afraid that the will of God may not be something so pleasurable for me. You know, have you ever desired something and there is that fear in you to say, well, if I pray that, Lord, let your will be done, it may not be something that I really desire <laughs> and love. Anyone who's ever had that experience? <laughs> now, that's the devil speaking. That's your carnal mind trying to sow fear in you. The thing you need to know is this. The will of God in your life is the real thing that will bring joy to you. Yes. Let me read, uh, let us read Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Let us quickly go there. It is important to be aware that when you want to do something, you are yearning for something, and then you find this feeling of fear in you that if I pray for the will of God, I don't know how it's going to be like. Maybe it won't make me so happy. That is not God speaking to you. And the opposite is actually the truth. If, um, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Now, you see what the Lord is speaking. What God is speaking. Brother Tenson. Now, it's really like he's speaking that to you personally, isn't it? Hmm? I want you to, to read that in NIV. The Bible says... For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Amen. God bless you, brother. So when you think about the will of God, 
God knows what is best for you. <laughs> and when you find yourself being afraid of the will of God, it simply means there's that part of the flesh which is still alive and it is trying to influence you. Mm. God knows what is right for us. But there's that fear certain puts in her heart to say, well, maybe the will of God is not something that you're going to enjoy to the full. What you need to realize is this. The born again experience is not just to make us excited and to speak in tongues. The born again experience can be summarized in this one thing. Being recreated by God to start walking in his will. That is what Adam lost in the beginning. When he was made in Eden, everything was perfect. Everything was joyous. Everything was in perfect order. Until there was a temptation to think, maybe God is hiding something from us. If we can partake of the forbidden fruit, we shall be like him, knowing good and evil. But you see, if, they, if a creature, if a being created you, and if that being is perfect, if that being knows the end from the beginning, when he speaks and gives an instruction, all creation has to stand still and hear. Because any slight deviation from what he has instructed, what his counsel has declared, that will spell disaster. Because he is not giving an instruction because he feels or he thinks it's better. It is because it is a fact that is what is right for you. Amen. Amen. But now, when we are born again, what is this born again experience all about? Is it just for us to speak in tongues and to enjoy the blessings of the Spirit? Modern Christianity has a way, you know, it presents the gospel to put man on the center of everything. What you call preaching today is really motivation. You know, motivating people to become what they desire, to aspire what they want, to have a financial breakthrough. And when you look at those messages, they should really be taught in business finance, you know, workshops and things like that. And the more that is being emphasized and talked about every Sunday, it becomes the only truth people know. But as you look closely to it, it's not really truth you're looking at. It is covetous men pulling money from people. Telling them God is going to bless them. Well, that doesn't take us by surprise. Because it is a prophecy which was foretold in the scriptures. Permit me just to read that quickly. Yes. Um, in 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1 to 3. Now this epistle was written so many years ago, you know, some about 1,500 years ago, some 2,000 years ago. But yet when you look at the words of Peter, it is as though he is living in our time to see what is going on. And this is what he warned those Christians in the early church. Second Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, 
Now notice, these people are not found in the taverns, in the nightclubs. These are not witches. These are people whose rising is from the Christian ranks. He says, they shall be false teachers among you. Whom is he writing this letter to? Not the heathens, but the Christians. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophet, uh, teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. Now when you look at that is a strong word, damnable heresies. Meaning it's not something to play with because it leads to damnation. It's not something you rub shoulders with. Because it has God's judgment hanging on it. They are called damnable heresies. Now what are these things? Verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now you see what we are having here. Because of the teachings of these men, people of the world will insult the, the way of truth. People are going to start saying, oh, you Christians, you are all the same. You are just after getting money from people. So because of what these people are going to present to the world as a gospel, the way of truth is going to be evil spoken of. Does that sound familiar of what is happening in our time? Yes. Now, notice as we go into verse 3 now. And through covetousness. Now, can I ask something? What is covetousness? What is to covet? Covetousness is an appetite to have more. You see someone has something and you begin to crave for that. I, I need to have that. I, I need to have that type of a vehicle. In other words, you are not content with what God has blessed you with. And now here, Peter is speaking about an element of people who are supposed to be preachers or teachers. And their primary motivation is not serving people, presenting the gospel to them. But their primary motivation is a spirit of covetousness. Wanting to live a rich life. Now, and through covetousness, what will they do? Shall they with feigned words. What is a feigned word? Something feigned is something that is, you know, you try to speak or do something. But that is just a counterfeit kind of an act. You are trying to show and express an emotion as though something really is happening when actually there is nothing happening. And so what will they do with these feigned words? Shall they with feigned words make what? Merchandise of you. So they're going to use feigned words. Trying to sound so emotional like God is speaking to him. Like, oh, the Holy Spirit is here. If you can give a thousand dollars, God is going to bless you. You are using feigned words, but actually what you are doing, it's not really God speaking to you. The emotion is not really a result of the Holy Spirit coming on a person. This person is after making merchandise business. He makes you a commodity. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not. And their damnation slumbereth not. And that is the state of what you call the gospel today. It places man on the center. You can be what you want. 
If you can think it in your mind, you can catch it in reality. Brothers and sisters, that is not what the born again experience is all about. It's actually the opposite of that. Are we speaking against prospering? No, sir. There are Christians whom God has prospered with riches. But they are equally Christians who are poor. But I tell you what, salvation is not about how much you have or how much you don't have. Amen. Now let us go to this passage. I want us to go to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 12. We shall read two verses, verse 12 and verse 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now hold there. How do you become a son of God? You, you become a son of God by being born again. When you are born a second time, the new birth is to make you a son of God. So as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, watch this. This is where our, we want to pay attention. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you are born again, not of the will of man but of the will of God. And if you are born of the will of God, it means your life has to walk in the will of God. For that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So it goes without saying that, that which is born of the will of God has to abide and live by the will of God. I love the way it is really brought out in the Amplified. But as men as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, that is power, privilege, right, to become the children of God, that is to those who believe in him, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Now, that's a whole lot of things it has mentioned, isn't it? That is to people who rely on his name. Now, let's read verse 12. Uh, sorry, verse 13. Who owe their base neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh, that of physical impulse, nor to the will of man, that of a natural father, but to God. They are born of God. Now, you are a believer. Let me see those who are confident. How many here are born again? You can be speaking to people who are not born again. How many people here are born again? You are confident, I am born again. Can I see your hand? Okay, we are all born again. Amen. But even when you get born again, you find yourself in a conflict. A conflict between your will and the will of God. There is a thing in you that desires to walk its way, its path. But the thing is, when we are recreated, when we became born again, we were born to the will of God, to be able to walk in the will of God. Why are we supposed to be born to the will of God? Because our will our ideas, our anxiety, our fears will constantly interfere with the work God wants to do in us. The will of the flesh can never walk in the will of God. It has its own anxieties. It has its own fears. It has its own expectations. And until that will of the carnal man. Until it dies, God can't use a person in his hands. A vessel is only ready to be used by God 
when its nature yields to the will of God. There's an old man in you. He died in Christ. But if you're not careful, that old man can resurrect. His ambitions, his desires, his anxieties, his fears, they can start living and walking through you. Let us read Romans 6, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. So our old man dies. For what purpose? That we shouldn't be slaves to serve sin. And what I want to show you is, when you look at Christ, all his ministry was to demonstrate walking in the will of God. If you pick the book of John, you can line it up in each chapter. The focus, the theme of Christ's ministry. The main thing that characterized this ministry was coming to do the will of God. We already saw that in chapter 1 verse 12. That we were born to the will of God. Let's go to the, book, the second chapter. John chapter 2 verse 4. We read that in the morning. You know, this was a time when wine had run out at a wedding. And so Mary, the mother to Jesus, comes to tell him that wine has run out. I want you to pay attention to what the Lord answered back. John 2 verse 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So this is a man who can't do things because he has an impulse to do that thing. Or because he has an ambition to try to create fame and say, let me do a miracle. His life is punctuated by the time, the timing, the season of what God wants him to do. So he says, mine hour is not yet come. But this is not how we live life in the world. In the world, it's like time. It's like your hour is fully in your hands. You can even create projections. I want to do this. Then later on, I want to be successful. But remember the admonishment of Apostle James. He says, oh thou fool. You who say today I'm going to do business in this city and then make some money. He says, what is your life but a vapor? God can require of it at any moment. That is what James said, isn't it? Then he tells us, this is how you're supposed to say. If the Lord wills, we shall do this and that. Now, that is a life of a child of God. Because time is not in your hands. Like the Lord said here. What have I to do with you, woman? He's speaking to humanity. To human beings. For you, your time is always right. You really have deceived yourselves as though time is in your hands. But I am not like that. My hour hasn't yet come. Praise God. Now, let's jump over to verse 24 and 25 Jesus was a spiritual man he, he wasn't influenced by what characterized the society in his time like today what characterizes our society in Christian circles oh you have to be someone you know you need to have money. You need to prosper. That is what characterizes our society. And if you are not careful, and your feet are not planted on the rock, 
you will really be tossed to and fro by the spirit of this age. But Jesus Christ, no matter how he found himself in a crowd of people, other people went to Jesus to try to impress him. Others spoke good and nice words to him. But he was never deceived by what man could speak to him. You remember one time when a woman said, spoke good words about him. And she said, you know, blessed are the breasts from which, you know, Jesus sucked from. Oh, maybe Mary felt good. <laughs> Jesus says, no. Blessed are those who hear this word. He, he didn't take pride in how you related with him. You remember one time when Mary and his brothers, the brothers to Jesus, half brothers of course. One time he was preaching in a place and the place was so very much crowded. There was no way, I mean, for people to go to him and maybe talk to him. So his mother and his brethren, they were just standing outside there. And they tried to send word. And the Lord was busy ministering, speaking the word. And they sent word to say, oh, your mother and your brothers, they want to speak to you outside. If it was you, what would have been a good, respectable thing to do? You would say, oh, oh, what my you want to just a minute. Let me go and see them, right? That is what you would call a respectable thing to do. Is that not so? But you know, people always saw him as controversial. What did he say? My mother's... I wonder how Mary would feel to hear those words. My mother's, my brother's are these who are listening to the word of God. You see how different he was? So, what influenced people's behavior? What was important as priorities in the minds and in the hearts of people? They never influenced Jesus in any way. And in verse 24 to 25 it says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Now, I want us to start from verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they did what? Why did they believe him? When they saw the miracles which he did. So the crowd swelled. Everyone suddenly wants to hear Jesus. But did that impress him? For him to say, wow, everyone wants to come and hear me talk. You know, we preachers many times can be mistaken by that. Where if everyone wants to listen to what you have to say, and well, you are really beginning to become popular. And here it says many people believed in his name. But what I want to ask you is, do you really think that was a true faith in him? Hey, there is believing and there is also another kind of believing. Because the verse that follows says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Wow. People believe in you, but you are not committing yourself to them. Why did he do that? Hmm. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So he couldn't be fooled by a crowd. He couldn't be fooled by people saying, Oh, you are the Messiah. A man who has truly met God. His ministry doesn't ride on the good, nice words people speak or a kind of a cult others may try to create out of him. Praise God. Amen. 
Let us go to John 3 verse 8. The Lord Jesus. He had intentions within him. Don't think Jesus used to do the will of God automatically because he had the spirit of God in him. No, sir. If it was like that, then there's no way we can say he overcame. It does not mean Jesus was doing good automatically. He was 100% a human being. But 100% God. He had intentions. He had a choice to do his own will. But you know, the Bible says in Hebrews, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And that is why he became the author of salvation because he took all his intentions, surrendered them, and died to himself. And says, I can only do the will of God. Praise God. John 3 verse 8. That scripture talks about the born again experience. And it says, The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canest not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. A person who is born of the Spirit, he knows there is God. He may not know what his future holds, but he surrenders all that he is to God. And say, I don't know what will happen, but I surrender all that I am to God. Like the way a wind is. You don't know where it comes, you don't know where it is going. And people who are truly born again, they've died to their ambition. They've died to themselves, and they let that wind of the Holy Spirit to guide them into the will and into the counsel of God. Praise God. Let us read verse 19 to 21. Here is a strange thing. God is revealing to us about his will. And when I speak words like this, oh, you would expect, well, obviously walking in the will of God is such a wonderful thing because it leads to peace. But the strange thing is, man is so stubborn. God can reveal his will. God can reveal the counsel of his will. But the stubbornness of man can still be intact. Because you see, when you're walking in your own ways, using your own eyes, you are like a man groping in the dark. But when God reveals something to you, that no, don't walk in this way, what you're supposed to do is this way. That is like light which has shone upon you. And you know, the psalmist says, Thine word is a lamp unto my feet. That is the life of a child of God. They pray, they fast, they wait on the Lord. Lord, what would you have me do? Even when you want to get married, the way of a born again child of God, you will never speak a word to any girl until you pray and seek the Lord. Because your steps are ordered by the Lord. Praise God. But you know, people don't love the light of God. Many times we love to walk in darkness. And here is what it says in verse 19. John chapter 3 and verse 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So where one doesn't cherish the counsel of God, the will of God, it is because in his or her heart they love darkness. They've never come to that point of meeting the true light of God. A person who is truly born again, what they are afraid of is walking in their way. Because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but its end is a way of death. So be careful with your life. 
When you have that feeling of fear in you, fearing to seek the will of God over a matter, what you need to do actually is to stop praying for that thing and start telling God, help me Lord. I still haven't known your ways. Give me your spirit. Because when you become born again, the thing that becomes your dominant fear is actually doing things in your own will. You are more afraid of that. Praise God. So that's the condemnation. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So you see that? Someone is afraid to walk in the will of God. Because there are certain things which need to be concealed. There is certain sin and righteousness which needs to be enjoyed. 